We might, uh, we might make a start. People will continue to trickle in and that's okay. But conscious of time and based on experience, um, Barb and I can both talk under wet concrete with marbles in our mouths. So um, it's probably a good thing to actually make a start. So welcome everybody um, to the next, I guess, in, in OPA Centre's webinar series. Um, last year, um, well, I guess since COVID, we started running these webinar series and we kind of at, at that point titled them um, a conversation. It was all about a conversation with. This year, we've tweaked that just a little bit um, to call it a spotlight on. And it's really about spotlight on people or places or even events uh, that sort of are shaping um, our industry or have a great story to tell that we can all learn from. And so today I welcome uh, Barbara Terry from the Christchurch, um, well, from the area of Christchurch. Um, but uh, Barb actually works for InvoCare and, uh, and she's with um, the Canterbury Memorial Park. And I always pronounce Hereford wrong. And I think that's the Kiwi accent that I don't quite get right but, but we'll talk about that later. Um, before we start though and I introduce Barbara to you um, just a, a few little housekeeping bits and pieces we do record the webinar and um, that's both for prosperity of course but also that we can share it later on with anybody who may not have been able to attend and we share that broadly through many of the cemetery and funeral home associations that we partner with so uh, it is being recorded. Uh, you can ask as many questions as you like. Um, Barbara and I will chat uh, and, and I guess I'll start leading that conversation. But if you have questions, please feel free to ask them. Along the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll see a couple of features. Um, there is a chat feature. We actually try not to use that. We actually prefer the Q&A feature that you can see along the bottom of your screen. So if you want to ask a question, just pop it into that Q&A and I'll feed it into the conversation with Barb. It just saves kind of that, uh, that conversation popping up in front of the screen um, for everybody. So please, if you have questions, feel free to ask them. Just pop them into that Q&A feed. Uh, that's probably it in terms of housekeeping. We try to run these webinars for around the 45 to 50 minutes um, and people can you know, often come and go as they need to. We understand you're all at work and you have work commitments. I apologise straight up. I have got a terrible flu. I am surviving on a diet of codril and Nurofen pretty much at the moment. And I do have a cup of tea with me. So if you see me sipping on my cup of tea, it's because my throat uh, is is <laughs> getting the best of me. So please bear with us uh, today as we run through our webinar. So I'll introduce Barb to you uh, in a little bit more detail. So um, I think it's fair to say uh, Barbara's heart is deep seated in the industry, having started originally uh, as a funeral director. Um, and then she took on the management uh, or the general manager position of the Cremation Society of Canterbury. Um, 15 years uh, in her role as funeral director and working, uh, I guess, in crematoriums. And I'm thinking now that you've started um, within Canterbury, Barb, this is probably a lot longer than 15 years now, I'm sure. So <laughs> um, I want to say personally that I have visited uh, the crematorium and memorial park uh, that Barbara runs. And they are some of the most beautiful memorial gardens that I have ever seen. And to know that I am seeing them after uh, what happened uh, with the earthquake is really quite a testament to Barbara and her team, um, because honestly, there was no trace of it. Uh, and I know, it, I think it was 12 years ago now, Barbara, 12 years last week, Maybe with that, is that about right? Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, and in the big scheme of things, 12 years is not a really long time. Like it sounds like it is, but I think um, when you visit the city of Christchurch and you see the works that continue to be ongoing uh, in there, it's quite a testament to Barbara and her team as to how beautiful uh, the park now looks. And I think that's a really important message that uh, I got from Barb is around um, the importance of her colleagues and her team. And I know from talking to Barb that that's going to come through um, as she talks to you today. So I think maybe the best place to start, Barb, is at the beginning. 
So uh, I guess we've all seen images of what happened with the earthquake, but we'd all love to hear it, um, I guess, as to how it played out for you and your team. Welcome, Barbara. Thank you, Ian. Thank you for that welcome and um, for the invitation to be here today. Um, it's a little bit daunting, I will admit. Um, in thinking about um, this discussion today, it made me actually appreciate that in the 12 years since we had our major event, I've become very conscious of other uh, international and national uh, natural disasters, probably mm. mainly, but also challenges that communities face. So at the moment, um, the families and communities in Turkey and Syria um, in the, the dealing with their um, devastating earthquake and in New Zealand at the moment we have communities in, in the far north and, and, and the east coast who are coping with the, um, the damage and the devastation of Cyclone Gabriel. So uh, my, my condolences um, to those communities and our thoughts are certainly with them as they put themselves back together and rebuild. Um, so 12 years ago, <laughs> set the scene. It was a typical Tuesday, um, a lovely day. I'd chosen to wear a dress, high heels and a new pair of pantyhose <laughs> on the day. Not the best attire for a natural disaster. Um, I was, uh, we, we had, uh, as intimated, I managed two sites, the Canterbury site on the eastern side of the city and the Harewood site on the northwest side. We had services in both chapels and um, uh, the, at the time when the earthquake struck, just before one o'clock in the afternoon, when the service at Canterbury was due to start, it was a, 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 a casket in place a lot of people attending, probably at least 200 people. The service at Harewood, there were a lot of people gathering because it was to be a large service. The description I'm going to give of how the day unfolded does centre around Canterbury because that's where I was, but also it's where we suffered the most damage. I was sitting in my office and um, chatting to a funeral director we became uh, conscious of a rumbling and then the force of the earthquake took over. He was thrown from his chair across my office. I stood and braced the filing cabinet behind me. It's well secured to the wall now. Um, <laughs> and I could hear at reception glass display cabinets falling, crashing, um, people crying out, our senses were assailed by um, all of these um, frightening noises and the movement and the sound of the earthquake. Felt like it lasted for minutes, but it was really only seconds. So once I assessed um, what was happening in reception, made sure nobody was injured, my thoughts turned to the many people at the chapel. My youngest son, was actually working for a few days in our memorial gardens at the time. He was a, a student um, and had a, a term break. He came to check on me and I immediately sent him to the chapel to assist. I checked in with my gardeners, gave them instructions, and then in my high heels, I, I hightailed it along the street to the chapel. I couldn't see the building. It was surrounded by trees. It was built in 1936, unreinforced masonry. Um, I really didn't know what I would see and was so grateful when I could see the building still standing. Um, but over time, I became quite an expert in unreinforced masonry uh, and many, many times sent up thanks to the uh, engineers, builders, architects who built that building in the 1930s. I, I was incredibly grateful. Um, what, uh, what confronted me uh, when I got to the chapel was uh, perimeter fencing, which was concrete block, 
had all collapsed. Um, people had poured out of the chapel that my, my chapel support person and the funeral director assured me that there was nobody um, injured and that everybody was out of the building. They were dazed, they were weeping, they were hugging each other. The ground seemed to have um, developed waves. Mm. Um, so the family had come for a funeral service. The casket was still inside the building. The building was still standing. The aftershocks continued. And uh, we, we discussed between myself and the funeral director, we needed to do something for this family. So I, decide, I decided that my uh, chapel support person, who was prepared to, and I would go into the chapel and bring the casket out so the family could have a simple committal. Um, others wanted to help, including my son. We, I wouldn't let them. I, I was prepared to take the risk. I didn't want anybody else to. Mm. We took a church trolley in, and there's a couple of steps up to the bear where the casket sits. So I'm not sure how, but we managed to, just the two of us, lift the casket down, place it on the, the church um, trolley, and bring it out into a safe area at the front of the chapel. Aftershocks continued to rumble. Mm. I, I remember noticing the disarray in, in the, the chapel foyer and um, in the chapel, uh, wooden pews with broken backs, um, things tossed. Uh, but I tried not to really absorb that um, because there was a job to do. Mm. So we, we had this simple committal. I made sure that everybody that was there had someone to help them. They had a means of trying to get home. We were actually in our own little bubble. We didn't know what the rest of the city was experiencing. Mm. We didn't know there was 185 fatalities. Mm. All of that knowledge was to come later. Um, it, in my office, when I was chatting to the funeral director, I said to I said to him, oh, I'll just I'll just charge my phone. It was only on 18 percent with a dodgy battery. <laughs> and uh, so that that 18% had to last me for an entire complex afternoon and evening. Um, communication was very patchy. It was difficult to um, get in contact with people. I made sure, made sure that my Hearwood team were okay. I had a great team. I knew that they would um, look after things there. Um, I was assured that the building was um, secure. There were no injuries and people were going to eventually make their way home. So that was the how it unfolded in, in those moments. Mm. I think, um, Barb, and I know that you don't necessarily like to harp on this, but um, I also want people to understand that Barb was at work. So Barbara also lived in this area, as did many of your staff. So while you were working in this, this, this space, um, there was stuff for you going on at home that you didn't necessarily find out about till later either. And as I say, I know you don't like to harp on about it, but um, it would be great if you could share a little bit of that. So... I wasn't sure when you'd like to pop <laughs> that in, but I've I've made a few notes yep. about the personal story. Now this is the bit that can get a person a bit weepy. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's okay, you're amongst friends, Barb. We <laughs> talked about this. <laughs> we I was very conscious that for all of us we had family, elderly, relatives, small children. It was a terrifying time for people who needed to be able to be with their loved ones. Mm. Um, I, I established that my husband was alive, but that was about all we could really um, establish. Once I got a sense of, okay, this is how we are here, um, later, much later in the day, I managed to make my way home. Um, by this stage, detail was filtering, filtering through about the enormity of what the city was facing. 
well, everyone was terrified. We didn't know whether we'd had the biggest earthquake or whether that was still to come. Yeah. So we were just dealing with what was in front of us um, and trusting that, that we would be okay. Um, I could only drive a short distance. I had to abandon my car. Um, liquefaction was everywhere. And actually, just on that note, the Memorial Gardens, we're in Ash Memorial Gardens, and we, um, if liquefaction was something that we got to know, it was the term that we, we, we had no knowledge of before. It's this, this liquid that bubbles up from, from the ground and, and then settles and becomes this solid muck with a mm. dreadful odour. Um, if and it was as if somebody had sprinkled fairy dust around the memorial gardens and said, this place is special. It needs to be protected. Mm. We only had a tiny, tiny little patch of liquefaction in the very back of the memorial gardens. If, if, if it had suffered the way the surrounding homes and streets did, um, it would have devastated it. Yep. So I really didn't understand uh, the impact of the liquefaction until I tried to come home. Um, I abandoned my car, walked, spoke to people, gained information, got to a very big bridge that I had to cross to get home and noticed an elderly lady approaching it. And I had spoken to this elderly lady at the chapel um, earlier in the day. And I said to her, oh, my Lord, have you walked all this way? And she said, yes, I have. You're Barbara. I, I, you spoke to me and gave me a hug. <laughs> um, and I said, where are you going? And she, she was going further towards Sumner to the very, very badly um, damaged areas. And she said, I, I said, well, we've got to cross this bridge. And there were large um, gaps that had opened in the bridge. And I said to her, you can't cross that. And she said, if you hold my hand, we will. She was very <laughs> stark and very determined. So we approached this bridge and we waited for an aftershock because they were rolling through. And then we counted and we jumped and we jumped and we jumped across the openings until we got to the other side of the bridge. And she, I'm, I made sure that she was okay with some people. She carried on her way. And I came up the hill. And as I walked up the hill, I became very aware it was so quiet, mm. very, very eerily quiet. And the houses up the hill as I walked, they were in various states of collapse, damage, broken windows. Curtains were blowing out of the windows. It was like I imagine a movie set might be. I could hear the sound of helicopters, which we became very accustomed to. And as um, I got further up the hill, my son came walking towards me with our dog on a temporary tether. He'd gone home earlier uh, once, once um, I could release him and he needed to check on our precious dog. Um, he told me to sit down. I said, in the gutter, he said, it's not good, Mum. You have to sit down. And then he struggled to find the words to tell mm. me that it wasn't good at home. And that's the bit that catches me every <laughs> time because he it was it was so tough for him to have to to have that conversation. Mm -hmm. But we linked arms and walked up the hill and got home. Um there's some images that I've shared that the concrete blocks for his bedroom collapsed in. If you've been in there, well, that's the scary part. You don't... I'll pop those photos up, Barb. I know there's some others we want to show later, but so everybody can have a look at these. Um, I will show you the photos that Barbara shared uh, of her home. There you go, Barbara. Can you see that now? Yeah. So. Yeah. So that's, um, that's my son's bedroom, the, the middle photo. The, the kitchen is, oh, there was some lovely red wine and, and that piece, <laughs> along with olive oil and flour and everything else all mixed in. Um, 
it was a it was a we just we'd actually started cleaning up by the time I took that photo. We just had to get a shovel uh, and start shoveling it in. And um, the photo on the right, number nine, and my lovely son and husband. So uh, that we 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 just wanted to go home after the um, the initial dramatic days were over. We were unfortunately one of the, the Hill families that had a terrible fight with our insurance company, very um, very cynical, very protracted, and mm. uh, six years later, finally, we got to put the key in the front door um, of our rebuilt home. Mm. Uh, it was it was a, a, a very difficult time that really tried us as a family uh, as it did everybody else. And our story is very common, and I want to emphasise that um, in everything that I describe today, throughout the city, throughout other communities, um, there are hundreds and thousands of stories just like that. It's not unique. Um, Barbara, just to get factual for a minute, because this is something that fascinated me and I didn't understand. I mean, in Australia, um, we don't get a lot of earthquakes. We do get pockets of them. Um, but you described to me the type of earthquake this was, because there are a couple of different types. Um, mm. Maybe that's worth sharing too. Well, look, um, for that particular earthquake, uh, it caused so much damage on the hills because um, of the upward thrust. So uh, it, the the homes, everything was, there was a huge, massive upward thrust. And then before everything settled, there was a, a second um, upward thrust. Mm. And a, a demonstration of that, and I actually couldn't find the photo. Uh, we had a thick front door mat and the, the house ate the front door. So... The, the front door mat, so the, the, the mat was shunted underneath Under as the house. the house came up and the house settled back down on the corner of it. Um, so that, that there are um, earthquakes where it's, it's more a ripple effect. Um, there's fabulous technical terms for it that I can't um, do justice mm. to. But the, our our um, district, the, the Canterbury region, had suffered uh, an earthquake in September before, September 2010, that didn't have the same impact on the city, but had devastating effects on um, some some of the districts. And yep. it, it had a uh, different um, character, I believe. So yep. it's... Um, the noise. I, I'd grown up in the south of the South Island. We grew up with earthquakes. They would be minor earthquakes quite quite often. Um, nothing devastating or frightening, but that was the noise I'd never experienced. Mm, yeah. Mm. So I mean, that was that was day one. Um, yeah. How do you? I guess how do you move on from that? Because there's there's you have to start somewhere on a rebuild. And my guess is that that really does happen from sort of day one, even mm. into day two. How did, you would have had services that would have booked yeah. the following days. So I guess, how, how do you keep service delivery going in some part uh, and then start to rebuild? Because there's there's the reaction and then there's that recovery component. Mm. Mm. Um, the news in New Zealand, the Funeral Directors Association, they have uh, a group, the Funeral uh, Funeral Disaster Response Team, yep. and they are led by uh, Simon Manning in Wellington, and they mobilise when um, there is a need. So. They were amazing. They came to Christchurch as quickly as they could. Um, of course, getting in and out of the city was very difficult. They they established a headquarters um, at Lincoln University, just outside of the city, and set about um, putting in place what they could to support the the industry. So that that was amazing for us as Simcrem. Uh, 
it was just us. Yeah. And so we had uh, cremations that were, were scheduled to happen that day. Uh, we had services booked, as you say. So um, it, we, we needed to set a plan. Um, and we had to turn to manual systems um, because we couldn't rely on technology or communication. Mm. So the first first thing was, um, are my people okay? Um, are their families okay? Are their homes okay? We we had quite a range of homeless to slight damage. The people in my team and also in wider Christchurch who had no damage, over time they sort of felt guilty because mm. they felt as if they they weren't sharing the burden. They but we relied on them. We needed them. They offered us some normalcy in, um, yeah. in, in small, what might seem small, but just incredibly valuable ways. So we needed to determine, right, people are okay. Our buildings, are they safe? Is our, is our gas safe? Because we, our cremators are LPG, mm. um, 45 kilo bottle um, powered. So uh, we needed to understand, are our buildings okay? Is our infrastructure okay? We had no, no power, no water, no sewage. Mm. We, at our Harewood site, it fortunately is self-contained in that it has its own artesian water well and um, amazingly a septic tank we're not hooked up to the uh, local authority mm, yeah so we could we we look we and we had a um a, a, a hard drive our, our server was uh, there was no cloud so <laughs> we just lifted everything that we needed to from canterbury took it to Harewood set ourselves up and then set about um, how can we do this. Um, it's the, the, the value of having strong relationships with local providers, I just can't emphasize enough. Um, remote, remote help is no good when people can't get to you. Mm. And um, so hands and feet on the ground are what needed we have stunning um uh, the, the our gas engineers are amazing our local refractory brookie um electrician uh it support all of these people are local people it's not quite the same now but i i've still got all of those people i could call on if i needed to mm. um they were vital so the, and the, the new person that came into that dynamic is the structural engineers. Of course, they were in high demand, um, big, but essential. So yep, I managed to uh, form a relationship with a structural engineering company. They understood the requirements for us to be able to continue functioning. Because to put that in perspective, Christchurch Local Authority has never provided its own cremation services. In the 1930s, when T.L. Jones, a local engineer, was convinced that cremation was the way of the future, he um, had contact with the local authority and they were in discussions, but they took too long for him. So he mm. set about establishing um, the Canterbury Memorial Gardens and Crematorium. And crematorium. Um, established the company in 36, started cremating in 37. So we didn't have anyone to fall back on. We had to be cremating. Our community needed that of us. And it's, um, I was going to say, that's a really interesting conversation. And this is a little bit of a question without notice, Barb, because you are right, at, at the time of disasters, and, and while Australians may not have experienced earthquakes like you have, we've certainly experienced floods. Mm. Uh, we've certainly experienced fires. And I suppose all of us um, 
through COVID at some point, those of us in the industry were being asked about those sorts of capacities. Mm. If, if we were going to have a significant increase in fatalities, yeah. um, these are the facilities that need to be operating. Um, I don't know what your experience is, here, but sometimes my experience has been actually cemeteries and crematorium are the afterthought. They're not often considered in cities incident response plans. Um, I'm interested in your thoughts around that, but then how do we advocate so that they are included in these sorts of things? Mm. Look, Leanne, you're quite right. And mm. uh, and also another factor, uh, in, at, at that time, 12 years ago, we were privately owned. So yeah. we were not part of the InvoCare um, network. Group. Yep. InvoCare offers us a great deal of strength. Yeah. And so the story today would be quite different, apart from the fact that actually you need cremators. Yes. Um, since then, there are um, there there are three small providers in the district now. Um, so we everything is not completely reliant on us. Um, however, we are uh, the largest provider between my yep. two locations. Yeah. Um, the the cremation is the end of the chain as mm. far as the industry is concerned. And, you know, they, they think nothing of um, booking a cremation for um, the end of the day on Friday with the ashes required um, over the weekend because the family had to fly away. And, mm. and think, well, actually, that's not that straightforward. So um, it's that we tend to start our planning for anything at okay, what result is required here? And, and then work our way back. Yeah. To see where do we have to start so that, that we, can, we, can, we can deliver at that point mm. uh, because we're so used to always being the end of the line. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. And, and often the last people thought about <laughs> around yeah. that. Yeah. Um, so, um, I, again, I'm just going to mention, if anyone's got any questions, please feel free to pop them uh, into the Q&A feature. But um, rebuild, Barb, and again, I've got some photos to share whenever you would like. But, yeah. um, I mean, there's, as I say, I've been to the Memorial Park. There's been a tremendous rebuild there. So um, how, how did that happen? And, and again, I, I keep thinking about the impact to you and your team personally. You know, there's this stuff going on for you all at home mm. trying to rebuild while mm. you're also trying to rebuild not only this really critical infrastructure but continue to deliver those services to families that um you know we, we fall back on what we so desperately need in times of disasters and and things like services for our loved ones are one of those things that people really hold dear to mm. yes they do you're right um the next morning it was uh, it was a tough night but we my husband and I made our way to a friend's place. They they said they had uh, their house was okay. Well, their their barn was okay, um, and uh, they had some water and whiskey, and we thought that was all you needed. <laughs> you'll, you'll do. So we still <laughs> have got a bit of rest that night. Um, yeah. The next morning, we had to obviously um, make sure the buildings were safe, but also we had up to 3,000 sets of ashes that had collapsed. The walls had collapsed. Mm -hmm. The ashes were fortunately in containers and they were marked, named. Um, there was an amazing uh, group that uh, evolved out of the earthquakes called the Student Army, which has become quite renowned, mm. um, legend. An amazing young man, Sam Johnson, was there. He became a leader overnight, um, mobilising his fellow university students. And 
he's a good speaker. His story is an amazing one. He's he's somebody that you should look at. I write that down, Barb. Yeah, <laughs> Stan Johnson, the Student Army. Well, we had our own mini version. My son and his fellow uh, his student friends, those that could, came the next day, uh, along with one or two other volunteers and actually one of those volunteers is still on our staff today which is pretty wonderful but they they came those that could helped us collect the ashes if the plaque was near and it was um, partially intact we'd put them together we identified a shed that we could safely lock and store them in those students that found that a little bit co confronting, um, we sent them off to get us food and water because the dairy wasn't open. <laughs> food and water, fresh water, um, weren't actually that easy to come by. And for all the Australians out there, the dairy is the local shop. Oh, the local <laughs> shop. <laughs> Thanks, Leanne. Yeah. <laughs> Pleasure. Um, we, we, so we did that for a start. But what came next um, was looking after, looking after the families and our, 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 our staff families, and I can't emphasise enough. The ongoing community cremations, um, we just, we, we have a great relationship with the funeral directors. We had that great relationship with our suppliers, our contractors, our specialists. They were all in high demand, but mm. they made sure that they could give us what we needed so that we could continue to meet our community responsibilities. Because it was the community deaths that we had to deal with at that time, the earthquake victims, they came later. Mm. Um, and, and sadly, um, only a few weeks later uh, in March, I think it may have been the 11th of March, Japan suffered um, a, a, a mega thrust um, mm. earthquake off their coast, causing a tsunami, a tsunami. and, um, and the, the devastation of the earthquake. Mm. So the families who, we had a lot of international students in one of the buildings that collapsed and a lot of those students were Japanese. Those families travelled to New Zealand as quickly as they could, and then eventually they were told, actually, you can't bring your, your children, your loved ones home to be cremated. You have to do that in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. Now, fortunately, we are knowledgeable on um, specific Japanese um, uh, ceremonies for cremation. So we worked very closely with our um, local funeral directors to meet the needs of these families. We, we worked six, seven days a week, some, some weeks, whatever was necessary. We just mm. did what we had to, to meet those needs. Um, and I've had the pleasure of meeting some of those families in subsequent years when they would come back. Um, and uh, for the anniversaries, and if I notice the memorials that don't they don't have flowers, I pop them there. I'd like yep. to think that someone would do that for me. Do that, yeah. You talked about um, you know we we started to talk about rebuild uh, and the ashes walls, uh, Barbara, that fell. And again, I've just popped these photos up. Um, because I think, whoops, I think rebuild is a really important thing to talk about. I mean, it's mm. people can get swept up with what happens, but um, it's it's the rebuild and the resilience and the courage of the team. I think that becomes mm. the message from most of these stories. And and these are the walls uh, now. So we took a long time to design walls that we felt would withstand future. Aftershocks, devastating earthquakes, well, they wouldn't. And so um, the facade that you can see is actually polystyrene. Uh, we designed something that was very lightweight and um, with uh, 
the ability to, to make adjustments of the foundations in the future if there were um, aftershocks that did cause ground disturbance but didn't actually um, uh, collapse the walls. Mm -hmm. So that they took a long time um, to design and build. The, the chapel, we took a long time um, to look at that. <laughs> Um, we took a long time to get the right advice. The, it was an unreinforced masonry building. It, it, they, it's um, an octagonal shape, and it, it's believed that the shape of the building actually helped it stand strong. Mm. Um, we, uh, after a period of time, closed the chapel for some months. We stripped the interior. We put a stru structural strengthening pinning system into the internal um, uh, walls, uh, into the, the interior of the chapel, into the walls, replastered it, put a new floor in, and there you have the result. Uh, it, it, we took care to um, be advised and implement a system that was going to give this beautiful lady another 100 years. Mm. Um, it, it had stood strong and protected 200 people on the day. Mm. And I wanted its life to continue. So that was a very, very satisfying uh, project to be part of. Um, uh, I, I guess I was going to say I am conscious of time, Barb. So for you, and, and you and I have talked a lot about this, because originally I was using words like resilience, you know, resilience to describe you and your team. And you kind of actually said, no, Leanne, it was actually more about courage. Mm. Um, and, and I guess that's a great lesson to come out of some of this for us all. Yeah, I... Um, you hear resilience a lot and mm. it's, it's a quality that we all um, respect and promote and, and aspire to um, contain. For me, um, I'm, I'm a very instinctive person and I believe it takes courage to actually be prepared to act. Mm. Once you have the courage to act, I believe res resilience comes as you are willing to continue to act, to continue to respond. Mm -hmm. And so um, it, it was the courage that came first. Yeah, it, that courage to take the first step. Yeah, I believe it is. But for yeah. me, for me, it is. Um, people look for a leader when when the, they are faced with difficulty whatever that difficulty may be they look to some they they turn and look for someone that that they can trust that mm. will make them feel safe if you're a manager or have a leadership position in your role they assume that you will be that person mm. yes um and if they're physically surrounded by threat then they need that so are, are you able to deliver that? Well, you don't know. You, you don't expect to have to be challenged. You don't expect to be put to the test. I never mm. believed I would. When I, I went into my house to get our passports, I felt compelled. I had to protect our identities. Don't ask me why. <laughs> and um, I, I wouldn't, my son wanted to come. I said, no. I went and I got our passports. I got a tracksuit and some sneakers. I went out to the garden. I got changed out of my high heels. Oh, yeah. And don't know what happened to the pantyhose. <laughs> and went to the toilet in the garden. Yeah. And that began, began the, 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 the recovery. It was the courage to do those things. I did them instinctively. I didn't question it. Yep. And everybody around me, we linked arms and we supported each other. We supported if someone was feeling vulnerable, somebody would feel strong. And it's only in doing that and empowering people to do that. Be a servant leader. Do what you do for the, for the benefit of your, your staff, your community. Um, don't do it for yourself. Because mm. that doesn't bring success. 
No, and I think that's the message of most kind of true leaders out there. Uh, I do have a couple of questions. Um, first one was around the, the building redesign, certainly with the walls. So was there consultation with the families uh, around that new build and, and what that design and structure might look like to help protect their ashes into the future? We didn't consult with the community on that aspect, but... Yeah. There were certain resources we, that we had that were so valuable, and one was photographs. We've got a great photo library. Mm. So people maybe 60 years ago had chosen a position in a memorial hall because they wanted to be near their cousin. Yep. Um, our paper records are great. We, we have... Um, that They've been well filed, well archived. We have access to them. So we were able to, in combination with this, reinstate the walls so that people were next to the person they were next to before. Mm. And if we, the public were very interesting. We would get phone calls the next, as soon as communication was open. Are my family memorials okay? Um, yeah. they, they were concerned about that. And so we had to assure them um, and for some people, we had to send a photo. But sometimes people were so stoic and so practical, they just expected us to be able to continue and deliver um, normal services in our normal way. And if we weren't able to do that, they were quite judgmental, quite aggressive. Mm. And we had to take care not to take that personally. Yep. When you're tired and fatigued and doing the best you can every day, um, you you can feel quite worn down by uh, certain people's attitudes. It's um, um you talked sorry Bob I'm sorry to interrupt because you talked about the um the the New Zealand uh, funeral director or the collective that have this disaster yeah. response group. Somebody else asked a really good question here. Um, is there an opportunity for the New Zealand Cemeteries and Crematoria Collective to engage with this response group? So actually the response group is far broader than just funeral response. Mm -hmm. So that um, there is an opportunity to keep those things going. Oh, look, I know that those two groups um, are moving closer together and mm. are talking. And I, I, that would be, it's so valuable. So yeah. Valuable. It caught everyone by surprise. Everyone yeah. thought that, that there might be a massive earthquake in Wellington at some time. But it, I don't think it was ever considered that there could be something like this that would happen in a, in a, a main centre yeah. elsewhere. There's been so many lessons that have been learnt um, from the Christchurch uh, situation. And, and I think one of the strongest lessons is People recognise that they, they have to be agile, they have to have strong relationships, people that they can draw on, and don't fix your mind that you will act in a certain way in a certain circumstance. That may not work. You no. may have to do something entirely different. Yeah. Um, and probably on that note, it's 9.55. So as I did warn you all that Barb and I could chat. Um, so I, I don't know if anybody's got any sort of last uh, questions, but you answered mine. I figured the well, the one uh, burning question I had, which is always a terrible pun when we do these things, um, I did wonder how the pantyhose had uh, survived the day, but you kind of answered that question. <laughs> yeah, no, I think long gone. Yeah, long gone. Um, well, then, look, thank you. On behalf of the team, oh, sorry, Lisa's just, just jumped in with a last minute question. Coffin supply. Um, I guess and probably not even just coffins, Lisa. I mean, there's there's a lot of things that go into um, a, a funeral service uh, and a, a SEMS and CREMS activity. How was supply within the industry in the days that followed? Look, actually, the, the, the caskets themselves, um, we're fortunate we have a casket manufacturer in Christchurch. That's so, that local resource thing you were yeah, talking about. Yeah. yeah. Look, this centralising is all very fine um, yep. for certain things, but we're two vulnerable islands. 
and um, so yes, caskets were okay. Other funeral um, uh, supply products do come uh, from the North Island and there were challenges around that. But I have to say that we were recognised as an essential service and um, they, there was a lot of work that was done by the Funeral Directors Association um, response team to actually support everything that uh, we needed to keep going. Yeah. Um, there's, there's, a yeah. Little, there's a little quote that I actually came across um, a day or two ago when I was thinking about this, and I wondered um, if I could share it as a parting thought. Please do. Okay, I'm going to read it. The good you do today may be forgotten. Do good anyway. Honesty and transparency make you vulnerable. Be honest and transparent anyway. What you spend years building may be destroyed overnight. Build anyway. Give the world your best. And you may get hurt. Give the world your best anyway, Mother Teresa. It's a, a message to aspire to, and it actually just seemed to put in one beautiful phrase everything that re was required of us at the time and ongoing. I'm not sure if it's at your end or mine, but I'm getting a little bit of lag uh, through the Zoom, Barbara. So for those that didn't quite get all of that, I might ask Barbara um, to send that through to me so that I can share it uh, cool. with everyone. And I said, it might not be your end, it might actually be mine, who knows? Um, but look, on that note, um, on behalf of OPA Centre and, and those that have joined us today with the webinar, uh, Barbara, I just want to thank you. It's always uh, an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Um, I feel in a very short space of time, uh, I, I found a friend, I found a kindred spirit in you, and that's been absolutely lovely. Um, I want to give a quick plug. Uh, also, we talk about New Zealand uh, funerals and New Zealand cemeteries. Both have conferences coming up uh, in the coming months. So if you do have an opportunity to get across, uh, I, I do know the cemeteries conference is in Wellington in May. And I think the funeral home conference is actually very soon. I'm, I'm not quite across the dates on those ones, but um, a, a beautiful place to visit and always great lessons learned. Uh, I know I've learned from New Zealand in a really practical sense through managing cemeteries, not only from you, Barbara, in this instance, but also uh, when you had um, the, the, the terrible issues uh, with the massacre in your mosque uh, and the lessons that we learned from Cindy out of that in terms of how to respond to that kind of a disaster, uh, I know stood me in really good stead when I was managing cemeteries. So lots to learn from our New Zealand counterparts. Um, so once again, Barbara, thank you very, very much. Like you, I think we all send uh, our best wishes to everybody in New Zealanders, particularly up in the North there where I know that they are continuing to, to battle what's happened with Cyclone Gabriel. So our best wishes to everybody in New Zealand as well. Um, thanks everybody. I've got, uh, and I know I've got some thank yous coming through the chat as well. People saying um, thank you so much for your courage today and, and well done. So I think that's a, probably a great way to end it all, Barbara. As I said, we've recorded the webinar. We will make that available to everyone. Um, but for now, go out and have a great day. Feeling Excellent. inspired, I think. And people are welcome to reach out to me if there's anything that they are interested to know, uh, any particular additional detail, don't hesitate. Love to share. Yeah. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you. Bye now. Bye.